And one of those ideas is the notion in the phrase absolute discontinuity of the continuum, right? Um, and I think it bears on this question of change and identity because um, the simplest um, illustration, literal illustration I've come up with um, of what I'm talking about, which again you, you could say is counterintuitive, uh, if, if one imagines or thinks the um, traditional understanding of a, of a mathematical circle, I, mean, I, I want to distinguish that from the circle that we draw on the paper, because mathematically speaking, strictly speaking, we never draw circles, because right. the line has a width and so on, right? Okay. So, the, the circle, as a mathematical entity, is understood to be composed, it's a continuum of points, an infinite number of points, right, that could be interrupted at any given place. Um, in the thinking now occurring, uh, that notion of a, uh, of a, um, ah, I said it could be interrupted. You could interrupt it in, mentally. You could make a break in it or something like that, you know, or, you, or if you're drawing it, you could make a mark, begin here and end here, okay. So you, you can have a thought project in which you could break it up into smaller pieces. But in the thinking now occurring, the circle is understood to be composed, it's still composed of an infinite number of points, and they still form a circle, but they don't do so continuously that each of that infinite number of points is a discrete, uh, I want to say thoroughly, completely discrete entity, right? Now that transforms the notion of point also implicitly, not right away, but implicitly, which is the notion that there is no, the point is not a zero dimension. And that would raise a whole other issue about zero and nothing and so forth, okay? But just one step at a time. So, uh, so if I apply it to living organisms, this notion that the circle, oh, so this would tie in with what I was saying about absolute otherness and the kind of objectivity and freedom that one other has in dealing with other others yeah. when there's no self-interest involved, right? When there's, as it were, nothing to gain or lose by the relationship mm -hmm. and one can act in a way that, to use the broadest possible term, is appropriate to what's what in that context. Um, uh, if I, oh, I was going to say, so uh, 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 apply it to the notion of identity and change. Um, oh, well, there's an intermediate concept, which is a little, it's a little more wobbly, but it's a, it's a, it's a decent analog, right? You have this notion. It's questionable how literally you can take it, right? Uh, scientifically, you have the notion that your body is changing all the time, right? and your cells are replacing themselves and your atoms and so forth and so on, right? There are some people uh, friendly to uh, Mr. Dawkins who uh, allege that, you know, you're just not the same conglomeration of atoms, period, that you were when you were a young man. Okay. Whether how literally true that is, I don't know, but certainly in large part, there's no question, but that you, you would, you would be inclined to say, remain the same despite the fact that your body is constantly shedding itself. Objection. <laughs> I would say your identity is not affected by the uh, replacing, which I think is probably true, but I'm not going to sign off on it, but uh, all the atoms in your body over time are replaced. Uh, no one of the elements that constitute your physical being was doesn't there. Doesn't affect identity. Doesn't affect your identity. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and if they're replaceable, it's not that there's no continuity, but it's obvious that the continuity is discontinuous continuity. Mm. And discontinuity and continuity are not alternatives to one another. And it reminds me of, um, you know, then there's, we're, we are living death in some way because we're, things are dying all the time. But yeah, 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 yeah. So that's related as well with this, this notion of, Right, biologically speaking. Discontinuity. 
What was the initial Well, I don't know that. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Now, no. I want to be careful not to tread on the territory of the scientist, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this explicitly and within the limitations of a certain ontological understanding, mm -hmm. and I'm noticing an analogy. You follow me? So I don't want to follow it unprepared into a territory which I'm right. not, not as equipped uh, as I would like to be. Okay. Uh, the initial term you brought up was the absolute um, discontinuity, absolute continuum. discontinuity of the continuum. Of the continuum. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, so ontologically, I think that's the case. I could see a reflection of it by analogy in such understanding, scientific understandings of the, right. of the, uh, the turnover of the cells and atoms mm -hmm. of, of the human body and of everything for that matter, probably ultimately, right? Um, but but it's a way of it's a way of calming the reader's apprehension that this is a completely strange notion that I can have an identity and nothing but change, and I don't need to introduce a notion of constancy like the self, something that doesn't change at all, mm -hmm. right? as it were, the support of that. Mm -hmm. And that ties in more generally in a metaphysical, in metaphysical language to the denial of the real difference between form and matter in the thinking now occurring. So, right, so uh, there is no matter and so Aristotle had the notion of prime matter. You never experience prime matter in Aristotle's universe because you always experience the material world in one or another form. It's already informed when we come upon it, right? right. Uh, I want to take that notion of the informing of the matter, and I want to get rid of the informing aspect, that right. the, the kind of pre-existent distinction, difference, right. and, and say that whatever matter is, it is at once formal. Mm. Whatever material entity it is, is at once unique and absolutely particular, mm. and therefore absolutely informed, therefore absolutely an intelligible. Mm. Hmm? And, it's not and the creative aspect that I, that, um, I think you, you speak of, the, 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 sometimes it's uh, easier for me to almost feel your thinking than it is to articulate it. It's a little difficult sometimes. Well, as you know, the, thinking and feeling are not alternatives in the thinking right. and feeling. I mean, yeah. they're distinctions. That's part of my question. They're, 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 they're distinguished. They're distinguished, but they're not alternatives, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What, I interrupted your question. So the, 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 I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, to put it in, in, in words, but it's, um, I think it's best maybe to go to one of the quotes that came up when I was looking at it. I think that'll, okay. that'll be better to, it's from um, Beyond Sovereignty again, and it's around the, the question of the imperative to create. Okay, do you know where it is? Yeah, um, page 156 and 157. There was something that I said here that wasn't the, the quotation first. Okay. There's how you, you know, you speak in Beyond Sovereignty of the imperative to create the world, where the creativity seems to lack the usual uh, sense of imagination and fancy that there's there's um, uh, some other implication of the word create here what does this mean this word create and how does a, how does a person create the world is it uh, there's sometimes these these uh, notions in, in new age thinking about uh, intentions creating the world which I, I know in your thinking kind of intentionality goes out the the window and the focus is on attentionality with, mm -hmm. with an A. Um, but the quote that I'll, I'll read to you is, is from page 156 and, and 157. And um, I actually had it from a, another part of the book, so let me see. Um, I'll read the quote once and then I'll see if I can find it. But it says, Quote, the absolute imperative is to write what was never written, to create, to write essentially and absolutely for the first time. This includes to think what has never been thought and to do what has never been done. Now, I believe you told me this was from... Yeah, it's at the bottom of 156, okay. top of 157. You what you just added there, that last sentence was from the preface version. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so can, what is this imperative? Can you explain this imperative to create? Okay, well, I think there are a couple of um, different issues. When you, when, you, uh, when you make note of the fact that it doesn't occur to you that uh, to create suggests what it might create uh, in the way of imagination or fancy, uh, creation in the sense of, I think, would be normally associated with the arts. Yes, maybe right? something like that. I, yeah. I, I think so. I think that's what you're, yeah. at least that's an implication of what, you, of what you're noting, which raises an even broader issue, which you didn't have in mind. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, is uh, we're so used to the uh, world of art, you're a practitioner. Um, but I think in the thinking now occurring, we think, not necessarily, by the way, now this is, this is subtle, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, but it's not enough, maybe I'll put it this way. It's not enough, and I'll, and I'll leave music out of it. Right? Uh, it's not enough, so, so let's say to create uh, a David or a Moses, Michelangelo creates mm -hmm. that work, right? Certainly involves his imagination, his fancy, and a lot of hard work. Um, and he makes something that wasn't before, right? Um, and I'm not going to go back to the old question about the matter that's there in the marble and so forth. That's not the point I want to make. Uh, the point I want to make is that it's, um, it's interesting. It's so interesting. Now, this is a new thought. I mean, it's not really a new thought, but I just had it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's there and the thinking now occurring, but I hadn't made this uh, connection in my mind. What, yeah, I, I, and I just randomly chose, without any thinking, uh, no, without any preconception, uh, Moses and Michelangelo, uh, or David and Michelangelo. What does he do? He makes a David. What I say in the thinking now occurring, what do we do? We make it, we make a Todd. We make a Dave, not a statue of a Dave, not a statue of a Todd. Huh? So it's not that we leave behind the notion of imagination and maybe fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that we leave behind uh, the notion of production, which is another term that's often a translation of to create, to produce production, to produce something. Right? That's what I say a lot when I'm making music. I'm producing music. Yeah, you're producing music. Yeah. What have you produced lately? Right? Yeah, okay. Exactly. Uh, so it's a step beyond. Right? Now, the statue is already a step beyond. So it's a beyond beyond. It's a creating beyond beyond. Um, it's an immediate. I'm not sure I like the word giving existence because it's redundant. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, in other words, gift is a big thing. You know, Derrida, in his despair, right. hung on to the gift. Uh, and giftedness is, is real, okay? But to speak of existence as a gift, I think it's redundant. Existence is the gift, right? In other words, so it's not so much the giving of existence, but it's the giving. It's so the foundational. Um, uh, disposition, constructive disposition in the ethic of simplicity uh, on page 88 of uh, Beyond Sovereignty is gratitude. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that implies, immediately implies, right? Uh, gratitude doesn't exist. Gratitude exists when, you've, when you receive something, right? Okay. So existence is, a, is something you have received. And so it's not so much that I give you existence, but I almost want to say in more philosophical language, in a certain way, I exist you. Um, and you exist me in that sense, right? Um, and now if you're thinking, you'll say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought every, every, each person had its own, up. Oh, now you got me doing it. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> I am blaming you. It's, it's like a meme. You've introduced a, a meme into the conversation, right? But each person is an absolute particular. Uh, its being is, as it were, independent altogether of its relationship to others. Its relationship follows upon its independence, its uniqueness, its absolute mm -hmm. particularity. It doesn't, it doesn't precede it ontologically or logically. It doesn't create, right? 
So in what sense could I exist you mm -hmm. without, as it were, appearing to preempt your absolute particularity, absolute uniqueness, mm -hmm. your uh, being who you are prior to our relationship? Right? Is that a fair objection to my own? I think I'm thinking the next thought, though. So yes. Oh, go ahead. What's the next so thought? Well, I didn't exist prior, though, to you existing me. I did? Well, OK. Uh, we need a lot of context for that. Yeah, it, it, there's a sense in which that would be true. Certainly, certainly, you didn't exist. If we add on here and now, as you do, yes. you didn't. Yes, that's, right. that's true. But another way of doing it a little more logically is that another Another fundamental notion, most fundamental notion of the thinking now occurring, uh, and therefore very abstract, uh, but I can flesh it out by reference to Hegel, is that in the thinking now occurring, identity and difference are not alternatives. Mm -hmm. So not only because after all, change it's not the same notion as as difference, but certainly they're inextricably bound up with one mm -hmm. another, right? Okay. So it's not surprising, given what we've said that identity and difference are not alternatives. And in fact, to put it very simply, identity and difference are identical. Okay? So that difference that you are and your identity with this I are not alternatives. Right? So, hmm. so, uh, so that we don't have to resort to temporality in order to see that in a purely logical way in the thinking now occurring. Okay. The alternative, I say this is a profound idea, even though the language is very simple and very abstract. Um, I, I uh, came across in teaching a course on Hegel a few years back, and uh, in particular doing a course on Hegel's logic, the logic of the encyclopedia, where at a certain point when he gets to the section on identity and difference, Hegel writes, identity and difference are identical. I just said that. Mm. Uh, Sounds like thinking now occurring, which is not, maybe not only not essentially new, maybe not new at all, right? Huh? But Hegel can't constrain himself. He can't stop there. So he writes, identity and difference are identical. And then, punk, sentence, next sentence, and they are different. <laughs> he has to bring in that recurring difference. He has to add on that difference. Mm -hmm. And that right there, in very simple, straightforward, everyday German English, is the dialectic, is the engine that doesn't stop turning on itself. Yes. Do you, do you see that? So if you can, so a certain spareness, a certain uh, edginess, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Not, how, how do you see that functioning in Hegel? That that what you just articulated. Yeah. There? How do you see that as, as still functioning in postmodernity? Um, well, it's just kind of, it's kind of, uh, well, it's kind of um, multiplied itself. It's a kind of, it's, the differences have multiplied in such a way to follow out in a kind of unending multiplicity, or hmm. something bordering, approaching chaos, right? If it isn't, right? Approaching chaos. I think that's a fairly good. Uh, scientific analogy, right? Mm -hmm. As you approach chaos, the the, tr the branches of the tree just multiply themselves, right? And they, um, uh, so at a certain point, you, it, it, as it were, it, it's a kind of, well, I think post-modernity, as it's hard, is, is, is modernity losing control. Mm. <laughs> right. oh. Yeah, it's losing self, it's lost its self-control, and, and post-modernity is, is the working out of that loss of self-control. Right. And uh, so it's a kind of staving off of a chaos um, it, it, with no hope of returning to the, to the certainty of Descartes or the absolute uh, doubt, as I call it, of, uh, and therefore the absolute certainty of, uh, of, of the absolute self-knower. Mm. Right? So once we've lost that, um, so we're in that approach now. But, uh, uh, Help me retrieve the, the, the question uh, that we just would, I'm trying to answer. You were, you were talking about in the encyclopedia about the... Uh, uh, no, 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 no. You, uh, you introduced post-modernity. So yeah. it's a multiplication of that, and the multiplication of a Hegelian 
difference, not self-enclosed as it is in Hegel's notion of this absolute, use a geometric uh, analogy, the absolute self-consciousness is an absolute sphere of mind, of divine being, outside of which, as he says, there is nothing. Okay? Uh, well, once that sphere cracks, right, then that extra difference that I just quoted from the line in the logic, which, right. which effectively starts the, the uh, self-turning of the knower upon itself ad infinitum, that infinity is contained by Hegel's notion of, of, a, of, a, of an actuality, um, an eternal actuality to that, I said it wasn't an evolution, it was a development within the eternal actuality of the uh, uh, absolute knower. Okay? But once I call into question the eternal actuality of the absolute knower, once there are kind of fissures or cracks in that solidity, then that second difference doesn't get replaced by another new difference followed by another second difference, right? right? It, 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 it leaks out into an indefinite number of differences. Right? Uh, so I think it's something like that. And I can't remember the exact way you phrased the question, so I may or may not be directly answering your question, but it had something to do with how did this relate to postmodernity? So that's what I'm trying to answer, but I don't know whether that was your precise question. Yeah, that was the question. It was about how that little addition that yeah. he made. Yeah, you see it in Derrida, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Margie it is really a text. And if I look beyond that text, where am I going to find Aunt Margie? There's a kind of infinite regress. Some, mm. uh, something mm -hmm. would be a horror to a classical mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also something of a horror to the thinking now occurring, but not for the same reasons. Right. And so you mentioned the kind of out of controlledness of this this difference that mm -hmm. uh, you know is in postmodernity. But there's also it's not the it's not the same notion. But I've often heard you talk about how you know there's nothing to uh, in this new thinking there is nothing to to hold on to in some way. You know the change being thoroughgoing, the uh, or the identity of change being thoroughgoing, that there um, not being anything to kind of rest on. Let's say. Yeah, that's right. And. Um, there's no time out is one of the ways I, which I put That's it. That's right. There's no time out. And, um, you know, I mean, some people might try to see the see postmodernity as a kind of um, iteration of what the, the, this new thinking is, is trying to say. That, you know, that it's, that it's just multiplications of difference everywhere and things are kind of out of control. There's no meaning to hold on to. But that's not what the thinking now occurring is saying. It's something that's, that's right. uh, quite different. So right. um, what is it? What is the difference? What's the positive? What's the difference between a, a, difference a, a, a between number of, a, a, an indefinite number of uh, differences approaching chaos right. and an absolute difference that is existence? Absolute and I think that's, I think I've just in effect formulated it. In other words, the absolute difference in the thinking now occurring is existence. It's, um, and, now, you were saying something about it in the thinking now occurring is there's nothing to hold on to. Of course, my immediate instinct is to say, no, 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 no. It's post-modernity that's holding on to nothing. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, and I, and I'm, now, again, I'm kind of what I like to call freebasing, right? <laughs> uh, we always like that. Uh, uh, post-modernity is holding on to nothing. Mm -hmm. It's touting it all. They have conferences. I was invited to a conference. I had to turn it down. I felt so bad. You couldn't go talk I about couldn't. That. I couldn't go and talk about the nothingness. <laughs> uh, you probably didn't feel that bad. Huh? You probably didn't feel that bad. <laughs> no, but I got a lot of guff. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, uh, well, couldn't you have gone and talked about something? <laughs> I I could have. I could have, but I didn't feel. I was up in the spirit of the conference. Oh, I see. You would have ruined everything. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, who's this guy? What's, didn't he get the message? He didn't get the message. Yeah, no, I didn't get the message. Mm -hmm. So I figured it was just, I would do everybody a favor, including myself, to stay away. So post-modernity is holding on to... It's holding on to nothing. It's holding on to nothing. It just won't let go of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's no existence in some way. There's, there's, there's no taking seriously existence. Yeah, yeah, certainly not an existence which is... Non-redundantly gift. Yes. 
right, which is received. Mm. And if it's, you could almost say that um, that existence as qua absolute reception doesn't even raise the need, the even the thought of the need, the possibility of holding on to it. Right? Uh, In some way, because it's it's not. It's a it's gift. Not, it's, it's not yours. It's exactly. And in a way, in fact, now we can clean up our act here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Existence is not your own, yes. not yours. It's sheer gift. Mm. And uh, therefore, it would be totally inappropriate to take possession of it. Mm. Because what gift, qua gift, what thing that is nothing but a gift wants to be owned? Mm. <laughs> Do you see? Yeah. It wants to be. You know, I mean, this thing is logical after well, giving all. Giving and creating are identical there. That's, that's the, the yeah, first good. That's Thank the you. thought that comes. Right. Yeah. Giving and creating. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so the thinking now occurring is not holding on to nothing. In fact, in the thinking now occurring, there is no nothing, period. I mean, so again, it's looking at it from another angle, as it were, another facet of it. Um, there, there's no, or as I've said in, in recent years in class, as a kind of shorthand, it's always dangerous shorthand, but I think it gets the point across quickly. There's nothing but existence. Right? That meaning there would be nothing but for the fact that there's not, nothing but existence. It's kind of redundant in our, our English. Um, so, that, so there's no nothing in the thinking now occurring in terms of which one could even raise the question of yes. holding on to it or, or um, or getting rid of it, which is, I think, a way you have phrased it. Um, to get rid of nothing is already giving it too much status. Mm. Mm. Right. Um, it's gone. It, it belongs to the thinking in the past. Yes. And that thinking in the past is not just chronologically thinking in the past. It's thinking essentially in the past. Right? So Hegel projects back onto the whole history of thought the absolute knower as the end point to which it was all pointing. Mm. Now, this would be big news to Aristotle and Plato, okay? let alone to Augustine. Mm. But that's modernity. Modernity insists upon seeing in the mirror of what it takes to be history, mm. its own image more or less developed, mm. more or less clarified. Do you see that? It reminds me of, you know, it reminds me of narcissists. Yeah, well, yeah, it's narcissism, absolute, absolute narcissism. all caps, all caps. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing that, that in some way was existing in this form of thought before in Hegel, right? It's, it's, it's... Um, well, no, well, no, well, we, we got to be careful now. Okay. Uh, it wasn't... It's there in Hegel. It plays. It's, oh, it, it, it plays. It definitely plays. It's excluded. It's there in the negative, right? It's mm -hmm. outside of thought, right? But it's, it's, I, I play on this in, um, the appendix to faith and philosophy called Thinking in the Third Millennium, hmm. uh, looking without the looking glass, speaking of narcissism, right? right. Um, and um, the way I put it there, I use a kind of uh, a homey, a crude metaphor with, the, I think, the donut. Um, and I can't go into that. We'd have to read the text. It's not, it's not worth it in this context. But the basic notion there is, I state, that Hegel, in excluding nothing, in other words, nothing being outside of, see, he means by that, he means to emphasize, I mean, it's ambiguous in our, the way we speak, in, especially in English, right? Yeah. There's nothing outside of this. There's nothing outside of this room. Mm -hmm. that we would mean, literally, that out there, there, there are no things, right? There's nothing out, if we, if we took that position. Uh, that's what he means, right? Um, and then everything that is, for Hegel, is grist for the mill of the absolute self-knowledge, the absolute self-knower, right? So it's consumed, right? So you go back to the dialectical uh, framework, that Aufhebung, the example I give would be the donut, but you could use a hamburger, anything works. Um, in a Hegelian world, so if, I, if you take me to McDonald's and we look at the hamburger on the, on the shelf, that hamburger, ha as such, as it sits there, has no truth of its own. 
Does it have a truth? Yeah. It's when I purchase it and eat it, consume it, when I reduce it to a function of my identity. Hmm. You see? Right. Which is the absolute antithesis of what we were talking about in terms of thinking now occurring in the other absolute otherness. Mm -hmm. right? When that other, right, does it have a kind of truth of its own? Does it have a kind of being? Is the, is the hamburger there? But hey, what, and I, and I say this in the, in the, uh, in the lecture uh, appendix, if, if nobody buys it, what happens to it? I don't know what actually happens at McDonald's, but it should be thrown out, right? <laughs> it's waste, or given to the poor. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, otherwise, it's wasted mm -hmm. if it's not eaten, you see? Okay. Well, that's, that's not a misleading understanding of what, where Hegel is at, right? Everything is food for the absolute self-identity, the absolute knower. And other than as food, it has no truth of its own, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so insofar as it stays on the shelf, right, and is not sublated, uh, not superseded by its being consumed, it, it's a nothingness, mm. right, uh, ontologically speaking, right? Now, what I say using that metaphor and uh, reference to Hegel in that context as background is that in the thinking now occurring, the creator, not the Hegelian God, right? But the oh, and by the way, let me just say this uh, to be clear: I characterize in, in, in a couple of important uh, footnotes in Beyond Sovereignty uh, Hegel's understanding of uh, the divine mind as creator as an absolute weakling, hmm. and by which I mean I'm playing on the fact that Hegel says, probably in a couple of places, but certainly in my recollection, um, emphatically in uh, his lectures on the history on the philosophy of religion. Um, he speaks of the elasticity of the divine mind. So you can imagine that the Hegelian, I'm using, the, this is my image, but I think the image is not, not untrue to the, the thrust of Hegel's thought. If you imagine, as imagination does, uh, the absolute self-enclosed, that's a very important phrase for Hegel, absolutely self-enclosed uh, divine being, outside of which there's nothing, if you imagine that it is in a process of a kind of creation, the kind of creation that is the result of the continual, actually it's, if you read carefully, the uh, conclusion to the um, phenomenology of spirit, or sometimes translated the phenomenology of mind, it's a kind of helical development. In other words, the, the cycle repeats itself, but not, not without difference, right? There's, uh, and that's, there's your second difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, it, it's a circle, as it were, within a sphere, but every time you come around to that place on the circle, you're at another level, like a helix, right? That's the idea. So in a certain sense, uh, Hegel was profound in his uh, pre-scientific uh, science. Uh, the place of the double helix and so on is, is mm -hmm. interesting. Um, that, um, this God is, an, an, would you say, an absolute weakling? No. Or oh, absolute weakling, because, here's why. Um, because for Hegel, the elasticity, oh, so what I was saying, oh, I know, now I'm back. So, so you're going around here, there's a, this is a perpetual beginning and end, mm -hmm. right? It's a dynamic beginning and end. It's not just the beginning is the end, that's Hegel. Yeah. Uh, but. It's the beginning and the end, and then we start over again at another level, so to speak. Infinitely. Yeah, and what that means is an infinite diversification or infinite differentiation, right. which is contained, unlike postmodernity, is nevertheless encapsulated in absolute self enclosedness, right? But you get rid of the absolute self enclosure, then you got postmodernity. Mm. Okay. Um, when I, oh, so what I what I what I point out there is that the um, let's see if I can get this right. Um, ah, so we have this infinite novelty within the absolute self-enclosure due to the repetition of the cycle, always with another difference added on number of differences. But the world that's created within that absolute self-enclosure 
there's not only nothing outside of that self-enclosure, but the world created remains within that absolute self-enclosure as the, the internal, absolutely, inter absolutely internal uh, dynamic of the absolute coming to self-knowledge of the absolute self-knower. Okay? So the, the, uh, the metaphor would be that Plato's creator never gives birth to the world. The world doesn't ever leave that womb. Hegel, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Hegel, it never leaves that womb, right? right? And so it's very powerful. It's, it's a kind of a mockery of omnipotence, do you right. say? Uh, Interesting, a mockery of omnipotence. Yeah, oh, it is. Oh, it definitely is. Yeah. 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 Uh, because it does everything that. It does everything out, out, of, its, out of its own uh, will and uh, yeah, so self-determination. consuming itself. Well, no, no, it, well, it, well, it is consuming itself, but it's a creative consumption. <laughs> it's, it's like the American economy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it keeps going because it keeps consuming itself. Mm -hmm. It keeps producing new, new forms of self-consumption. Right. OK? Well, you can imagine what would happen, theoretically, if you just keep eating yourself. Mm -hmm. right? Not very tasty after a while. Yeah. Okay, so uh, but the point is metaphorically that nothing, there's nothing other than this absolute self knower. Nothing yeah. other, because whatever otherness is in that finite second moment, which keeps getting sublated, yeah. keeps getting uh, to be shown to be it, its own nothingness, hmm. and there you can use the word its own nothingness quite appropriately. Right. Okay, all right. Whereas in the thinking now occurring, the whole point is that the creator, where there's nothing but otherness, we're not surprised to find that creation involves the creator creating a universe that if I were to use, it's, it really doesn't, it's, it's only by a temporary analogy that the analogy, you know, I should even say this, right? But if, if inside and outside made any sense, they do, by the way, to Thomas Aquinas, so mm -hmm. he's a pre-modern. He's still thinking about outside of God whatever that could possibly mean. <laughs> uh, but if one thought the way Thomas thinks, but didn't want to be Hegel, one would have to say that the, the God who creates the world ex nihilo creates that world as something, in Thomistic terms, outside of itself, hmm. other than itself, completely independent of itself. You see? Um, and so the otherness that I'm attributing to the world, to, right? Uh, is anotherness that is, in, I don't like the word again, essential to it in, in the very nature of its coming into being, in the very nature of its existence. It is otherness through and through. And who could achieve something other than itself that was otherness through and through in being other than itself, but omnipotence? That becomes, in the thinking now occurring, the very precise understanding of what omnipotence is all about. It's not about and, and, and our tradition, even the uh, tradition of faith, even the pre-self-conscious explosion of modernity, in that tradition, there are all kinds of lurking hints of the notion of providence as control of some mm -hmm. sort or another. Do you see what I'm saying? So when Badiou, when I quote him and I respond to it in uh, Beyond Sovereignty, when Badiou uh, um, mm -hmm. rejects the notion of omnipotence philosophically, uh, he does so because he uncritically, I mean, just automatically, as the justification for not taking a serious notion, uh, he automatically assumes that it must mean some sort of providential plan, some sort of pre-existent plan, right? And there's a lot of justification for that in the anthropomorphic language, even of scripture, right. okay? But when one thinks about it, especially when one thinks about it non-self-consciously, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, uh, and uh, if, as I say in Beyond Sovereignty, if Jesus says, take no thought for the morrow, you think the least he can do is uh, practice what he preaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you see omnipotence moves to new ground, I believe. Yeah. That's one way of yeah. saying it. Well, uh, the, the moving to new ground is a kind of c further clarification uh, that has been... Um, this, this is interesting. Well, let me, let me make an unqualified statement first. It's a further clarification of the, uh, I would say, basically increasing 
comprehension of the revelation with a capital R, the revelation, both the revelation of the Old Testament, but it, most particularly it, the incarnation. The incarnation is the key, the key uh, event in the in the context of thinking now occurring. Um, that that revelation, the comprehension of it, would appear to have been set on a detour by modernity, right? If modernity has appropriated from Thomas, who as far as he went didn't hadn't. Thomas, who, as far as he went, didn't go too far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if the appropriation of the form of thought by Descartes, f shaped by Thomas, uh, in one sense is a detour, uh, it's a detour which, as it were, I'm not crazy about the term paradox, even though it's used a lot by my friend Kierkegaard, mm -hmm. um, somewhat paradoxically, uh, it has cleared the brush. It has done the kind of preliminary work. Even that's too strong. But it, the work that it has done has introduced a kind of clarification, which was his intention. I mean, that's what they call it. One way of understanding what they call it is about. He wants to get it all bric-a-brac and get, right? OK. So he wants the clarification of thought. And that goes right up through uh, it, Hegel in his own way is, is the absolute clarification of thought. And then you have a pushback in a technical sense, especially from Husserl, who wants to uh, go back and start over again with Descartes and kind of uh, challenge certain basic uh, presuppositions of Descartes' meditations, but again in the, with the goal of a more purified, more clarified uh, understanding of the relationship of the mind to the world in the, interests, uh, in the same interest that Descartes has in principle. Uh, which is to advance uh, our knowledge or science of, of the world, of our experience. Um, so I, what I'm saying is that um, modernity is both intelligible as an appropriation. You might say, to, to make it a little more explicit, something of a misappropriation mm -hmm. of the uh, transcendental form of natural reason in Thomas. But the, as it works out, it clears away some residual uh, stock that Thomas was dealing with uh, that despite whatever he did by way of clarification of thought, um, he didn't attend to. Right? So modernity is attended willy-nilly uh, to a kind of further clarification with the proviso that it's doing so in a fundamentally mistaken on a fundamentally mistaken premise, mm. namely that this thinking is its that that the that the thinking that ensues upon the revelation can be understood to be its own thinking, which is what Hegel does in spades. Right? Right. Okay. Uh, there's a paradox here, which. Um, um, How do you understand the word paradox when you when you think that word? Because it's an interesting word. Uh, well, the paradox, I mean, I think our normal usage of a paradox is that something which is true uh, appears not to be true, or something that doesn't make any sense mm. does at a certain level make a sense, make sense. I think it's something like that. Um, although Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's use of the notion of an absolute paradox raises interesting questions. Um, about that, but normally I think that's what it means. Literally, it would mean um, doxa is, depending on the con everything context, mm -hmm. opinion, thought, and then this would be a Even kind of faith, though sometimes, right? Faith, doxa. Yeah. yeah, well, orthodoxy, the right, right, right thought. Doxa. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was looking up the word dogma recently for some reason, some provoked by somebody or something. Uh, and uh, I don't think I, I may have discovered this years ago and have forgotten it, but uh, dogma in Greek means um, to to think something to be true. So I mean, it's loaded with all kinds of um, uh, connotations that ensue from the use of it in turn. But so the dogmas of the church, literally speaking, are just statements of what we understand to be true. It's just, exactly. You know what I'm saying? In other words, the notion of inflexibility and so on is added on. Right. right? Uh, OK. The response to that initial. 
Yeah, something like that. Yeah, or the fact that you won't change your mind. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, where was I? Oh, I wanted to allude to. I don't know. This is dangerous. Uh, but I've been reading uh, recently this uh, fourth volume of N.T. Wright's uh, uh, magnum opus, Christian Origins and the Question of God. And the fourth volume is all about Paul, which is his, I think it's always been his central personal, central personal scholar, not his exclusive interest. Um, let's see if I can tie this in with what I was saying. The, um, uh, he has a very interesting, I mean, um, new to me, and it may not be entirely new because he's a, he's a biblical scholar and, you know, maybe he's not new to his, his peers in the world of uh, contemporary biblical scholarship, right? Um, but you know, just on the surface of things, what, what Paul has in mind when he writes the letter to the Romans and various parts, what he means, this has been bu multiple bones of contention in the Protestant Catholic dialogue uh, since the Reformation, right? Okay, so there are lots of issues here. Mm. Now, I have to say on behalf of Wright, his, he's not really very much concerned with that. I mean, he notes it, he notes it. But this book is about Paul, and the whole point as an historian is not to say, not to try and read back into Paul some 16th century understanding what Paul is saying in Romans. It's just trying to understand what we can understand Paul to be saying in Romans in the context of the, of what the Wright defines as Second Temple Judaism, mm -hmm. and more particularly in the context of the, of the culture, the beliefs, the worldview, the mindsets, and most importantly, the texts uh, of uh, uh, the late uh, Jewish scriptures which were excised by the rabbis in 200 AD because the Christians were relying too much on them. Those are, those are the texts, certain portions of Maccabees and the Book of Wisdom that appear in the Greek version of the Old Testament um, about the year 200 BC. Okay, I'm getting a little off what I need to do. But um, uh, the point is that in reading what Wright has to say positively, and I can't do justice to it, but I'll give you a rough idea. Um, the bottom line is that what Paul is really saying about the relationship between the law and faith, Torah and faith in Christ, or faith in the Messiah, to be more, even more historically accurate, the, the, because Christ has kind of become a, you know, Buddhists could use the term Christ today. I mean, Jung, you know, uh, I'm really Christ. You know. Okay, so if you look at it historically speaking, Christ is the Greek translation of the word Messiah, and the right. Messiah had a very concrete historical meaning to every Jew, including Paul, right. in the first century. Um, but Paul, to me, uh, interesting, certainly challenging. I don't reject it at all, but uh, I don't think I've ever come across it before. His notion is that the Torah, this is, his notion is that Paul's notion is, right? Um, and again, I, I can't do, uh, I can't do all the no nuances, that Paul's notion is that the Torah was given to the Jews, the chosen people, with the, the paradoxical, I think Wright may use that term, but I'm certainly using it in trying to encapsulate his thought about Paul's thought, with the paradoxical notion that although the Jews were the people chosen by God, and to whom he promised ultimate redemption and salvation. And although they, in promising that ultimate redemption and salvation, there was envisioned that through that redeemed people, the whole of the world, the whole of creation, would be further redeemed, right? Okay, so in other words, um, and you see that's the prophetic, the universal strand in the, in the prophetic tradition in the Old Testament, especially, of course, in Isaiah, but not just in Isaiah. Uh, Wright's notion is that what Paul is talking about, although it's dense and difficult to, you know, you, you got to really work at it to, to lay it out, and he does, 1,500 pages, <laughs> uh, is that 
what I'm calling the paradoxical effect of the Torah was that it was given to the chosen people who had this mission, right, and to whom God made certain promises in and through the realization of which he would ultimately redeem the world, right. Um, uh, the notion is that what the Torah actually did, and this would not be outside of God's providence, right, to use traditional language, um, was that it just called to the attention of the chosen people that they had the same problem as Adam had. In other words, they had the universal human problem of not being able to live up to the Torah. But that the giving of the Torah, as Paul does say in Romans, right, sin begins with the, right, before the, before the law, there was no sin. In the, understand in the context, right? It brings to consciousness, I almost want to say self-consciousness, it brings to consciousness the sinfulness even of the people through whom God uh, intended, as it were, to, uh, to save the world, right? Okay. So the way, the way he puts it is that sin was forced into a corner, right? It, in other words, there was, no place, there was no place to go where there wasn't sin. So in that sense, Wright's metaphor, it, it was forced into a, into a corner and by forcing sin into a corner, that made, that made intelligible the, um, well, the crucifixion of sin, the redemption in the, in the form of the crucifixion, the putting to an end of the tyranny of sin over uh, not only the Jewish people, but also over the human race uh, in general. If you get something, uh, it bothers me to repeat that because I can't, I mean, right is very subtle, okay? But you get the, that's the thrust of it. Uh, I think this, uh, but it occurs to me, having read right on this topic, that there's an analogy with modernity, uh, uh, that uh, the self-consciousness that was not full-blown, right, up until uh, modernity, in becoming full-blown, is there's, there's no place where it doesn't lay claim. It's no place, right? It's cornered in a certain sense. It's kind of a paradox or paradox, uh, right? The, the widespreadness of sin, the widespreadness of uh, self-consciousness in the modern world is um, inver by inversion. It's the cornering of it. It's the, it's the, um, the clear and unequivocal identification of its limit in, in intellectual terms now. You see what I'm saying? So. So it is timely, not necessary, but timely, as it were, that the thinking now occurring now actually occurs, mm. right? Um, now, I don't remember whether there was a question that led into that, but... Um, Part of it came out of this question of omnipotence moving to new ground. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so this is the time when, analogously to the... So I could, I could use uh, loosely uh, the, the movement from, well, Christianity mm -hmm. as revelation given to the Jews and the God of revelation, I, I don't, I'm not entirely comfortable with it, but there's an analogy to moving to new ground. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a, there's a further, completely, uh, as Wright emphasizes for Paul, especially as a previously zealous Pharisee, a completely, you know, if you want, shocking, um, the unexpected um, end to the pro realization, fulfillment of the promises uh, in a way that, you know, no one, including Paul, expected, right? Mm -hmm. so that, that's the thrust of it. Um, uh, so in that sense, it would be analogous to the notion that uh, in the thinking now occurring, we have omnipotence moving to new ground. In other words, we're, we're understanding something uh, in a way as different, and in its own way, intellectually speaking, as shocking or, and or offensive um, as uh, a crucified Messiah would be to the, uh, to the non-believing Jews of, uh, that were contemporary with Paul, right? right? Um, it's not quite the same, because I'm not saying that there is a new historical event comparable to the Incarnation. Right? So, but it, but, right. but it is, but it is analogously, it's analogous to the uniqueness of the incarnation, the uniqueness of this new thought, mm. the new outworking of, 
of what is ultimately an effect over time of the incarnation. And you refer in using this word omnipotence, um, I think it's in Beyond Sovereignty where you really develop this notion of the difference or you use different terms. You use the, the, the term created omnipotence right. and the term uncreated omnipotence. Right. And effectively uh, human persons in some sense are take um, participate in that. And I wanted you to Created omnipotence, yeah, right. Uncreated Participate omnipotence. And created omnipotence. Uncreated omnipotence. I add that term when I'm when I'm when I bring up created omnipotence. In other words, what I've been talking about hitherto is omnipotence. Yes. Same thing as uncreated omnipotence. The divine being, right? Qua creator. Um, so uh, created omnipotence suggests that in the thinking now occurring thanks to the history of thought as a preliminary, but not as a necessary consequence of that history of thought again, okay? De facto, uh, the thinking now occurring, as it were, occurs actually now in such a way that it is free of, it's free of some of the corollaries of that incipient self-reference that's been there all along, whether in Plato, Aristotle, or a little more explicitly in Augustine and even more so in, in Thomas, right? And then full-blown in uh, modernity. It's free of some of the corollaries of that, right? And in terms of the term created omnipotence, it's free of the limitations that we would only impose on omnipotence, uncreated omnipotence, as a function of our self-consciousness. So going back to beyond sovereignty a moment, I mentioned Badiou rejects omnipotence as a useful philosophical concept because it's associated with this kind of plan. Uh, and he's into novelty, and that's what the thinking now occurring, that's, that's the point of intersection mm -hmm. with Badiou. I mean, novelty is, it's hard to say anything bad about novelty of the thinking now occurring, and Badiou is all about novelty. Um, and so a plan seems to constrain novelty. Now, of course, since I'm on that point again, and let me try and remember to get back here, uh, if I go back and look at the way providence and plan, God's plan and so forth, you, one thing you notice in the Old Testament, if God had a plan, he should have thrown it out day one, right? So, I mean, what does plan really mean, right? Because he keeps, he keeps changing the plan. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So what we're really talking about, that's why I say it's a kind of an innocent anthropomorphism to think that he planned this and then it went wrong and made a new plan. But, or he didn't make a new plan. It was always in his plan to, it was, it was a part of his plan, this is right. It was part of his plan that the plan wouldn't work. <laughs> you know, and that's the continue. as much as I like right, I mean, he's not, he's not beyond modernity. He's not. He'd like to be, I'm sure he'd like to be, but he's, he's not there intellectually. <laughs> uh, so really, if, when the thinking now occurring looks back on this plan that included the plan going wrong, <laughs> it says, we don't need that. That plan is a projection of our limitations. It's, a, it's what we do living for tomorrow, right? right? And uh, it's a projection on the word itself. Omnipotent, right? It's yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, we can we can easily do without that. There's, I mean, what it, it just it only adds kind of uh, cumbersome paradoxes that you know. Uh, much better to I would say, you know, thinking now occurring would say what what's behind all the planning, whether it's the big plan that includes little plans and missteps and so on, or no plan. It's love. Hmm. In other words, the constant. If there is a constant in the inconstant the world of the thinking now occurring, if there is a consistency in all of the inconsistencies. This, is a lot, this strange logic works very nicely on top of this, right? So if there's a consistency in the inconsistency of the divine planning in the Old Testament, what is the consistency? It's love. And what is it about love? It's totally open to change, hmm. right? You know, oh, because I have a new hairdo, you don't love me anymore? <laughs> So we know, we know, we know instinctively, intuitively, right? That love is, love. The demand upon love is absolute flexibility, right? Um, and so that's what that comes to the fore in the thinking now occurring. There's no need for the plan. So omnipotence loves, 
And the form of the love is to create something absolutely independent, absolutely other, and then to be open to, open to, not looking for, but open to, in principle, as it were, as if omnipotence would have to act in principle, uh, rejection. There's an exposure, absolute exposure of the creator to the creation, as it were, as the price of being not an absolute weakling, but absolutely, truly omnipotent, right? To make something over which you might be thought otherwise to be able to have control and to have absolutely no control over what happens, you see? And by the way, speaking of the big nothing, is the nothing is what absolute self-consciousness in its degenerate form sees when it looks at omnipotence. Hmm. Because it doesn't see even the pretense of a plan or even the outline of a being, you see? Because it can't comprehend, because by looking at the nothing, it avoids the notion it built into the created omnipotence that what otherwise would be the nothingness is the, is the negative self-conscious form of the imperative that flows from the absolute giftedness, which is existence itself. Hmm. And that imperative that flows from the absolute giftedness of existence itself is to create the world, and to create the world as a, as a form of omnipotence, created omnipotence, properly lacking, as I put it in uh, section three of uh, Beyond Sovereignty, properly lacking to uncreated omnipotence. So, um, And why is that particular piece important, the properly lacking? Because it's, well, in the first, put it in theological terms, in the first instance, we, we say in the creed, the Father is the uh, almighty creator of heaven and earth. But then when we look more closely with the Son and the Spirit, how does that creation take place? In and through the Word, uh, John 1, right? Okay. Uh, so what does he do? I mean, I'll put it in crude human terms. Dad says, it'd be nice to build a house over there on a piece of property. Uh, son, come here. <laughs> I have a job for you. Okay. As it were, all right? it's, a, it's a crude metaphor, but I think it gets the flavor. The father doesn't waste his uh, fatherhood. <laughs> he assigns the creation of the world to the son. And then when you take the incarnation into account, and this is something we haven't talked about at all, right? but it's there in the background. If the incarnation is a real event, okay? not a pious notion, not a Gnostic good idea, unanchored from its Judeo-historical, Judeo-Christian historical roots. Um, that is the way it actually came into the world, put it simply. Uh, then if the incarnation is a real event, as real as you and I sitting here, if Jesus as the incarnate, an incarnate divine person, a man who is at once the divine person, and the divine person there's no distinction between there's no ultimate distinction between person and nature. So a divine person who is a human being doesn't cease to be the divine being. Right? So God, man is the traditional language of the fathers. True God, true man. Uh, if that event occurred actually, as of course is the content of faith, orthodox faith, uh, what are the implications? If the creator of the universe becomes a creature, becomes that which he made, and if the creature is part and parcel of the universe, that has to affect, one would, one would rightly assume that that affects a transformation, maybe over time, right? but it affects a transformation in, in the creation, in the, in the natural world and in the human world approximately. Right? That's the idea. So, by the way, this whole historical development of thought that I've been talking about, pivoting on the incarnation as a real concrete historical event, is intelligible as, as the outworking, as one level, one form of, one, one effect of outworking of the, of the uh, transformation of the universe begun in and through the incarnation of the, of the word. 
Now, did I interrupt myself to get to there? It was the properly lacking piece that I was. The properly lacking, about. okay. So then I went off on the word was, as it were, crudely, delegated to be that in and through which all things are created in the language of John. And then the incarnation involves the incorporation of humanity, first, first and foremost, in the form of the church, the concrete church, the apostles and the disciples and the, the whole organization that grows up over time. Uh, the incorporation of humanity, first and foremost, in the form of the church, an incorporation in the universe, ultimately, uh, how can I put it? I'll, I'll say essentially transformed in, and in the form of the resurrected body of the incarnate word, all right? So I would say, insofar as the, the word assumes the form of a creature, but the point being, not just the appearance of a creature, really becomes a creature, then that transforms the human nature, it transforms the, the universe. But that transformation, which is, let's say, there up to and through the crucifixion, is squared, if not cubed, in the resurrection, right? So now we have that same human nature in the language of Paul, glorified, right? Spiritual body, but nevertheless a real human body, now powered, as it were, engine, whose engine is now not the suke, not the, the soul, the principle of life that Aristotle knew and that everybody in the ancient world knew, but now the pneuma, right? Uh, so the divine spirit, insofar as it is the, um, the life, yeah, the principle, the suke is replaced in effect, or certainly subordinated to, subsumed by the divine spirit in the form of the spirit inhabiting the resurrected body of Christ in which, as Paul makes clear uh, in numerous ways, um, in which uh, human beings are actually incorporated, right? So we're, we become members of this body, but the body that he's talking about is it almost goes without saying in Paul, and I think it may, it may actually go without saying, is the resurrected body of Christ, okay? Um, so, if, if the incarnate word is the incarnation of he to whom the creation of the world was delegated, and if, to use the language of Paul, the incarnation made a big change in the original plan, so that it was not simply a matter of creating the world, but entering into it and therefore transforming it into what Paul calls a new creation, right? uh, part and parcel of that new creation is our incorporation in the, the one to whom the creation in the first place, and now again, even more personally, you might say, has been delegated in, in the risen Christ. So the created omnipotence is, exists insofar as we are incorporated in the universe qua body of the resurrected Christ. Hmm. That's, That's a lot. Huh? That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you must have asked the question. I did. I asked some question. <laughs> <laughs> kind of leaves me speechless. Well, <laughs> I, I have no questions to ask you. <laughs> well, I wouldn't answer them anyway. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, you, could, you want to express shock or dismay or? Uh... Um, no, not at all. I mean, there, there's something quite elegant in what you just said. Oh, okay. I think it's more kind of awe than anything okay. else, uh, the way that you've explicated it. Okay. Um, well, what I find awesome is not my explication, although I'm happy to hear it was successful. Yeah. Uh, it's the reality. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a word sometimes that you use um, that just came to my mind, um, and it's it's you use it in juxtaposition or to kind of uh, um, in opposition. Maybe that's the wrong word to the word utopia. It's the um, ani uh, uh, theta. Uh, yeah, how do you it's that a word? it's a mouthful. Uh, well, I think you're. Ref well, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I use it in. Uh, it has to be the word that comes up in beyond sovereignty. Yes. It's it's. Uh, I don't think it's the same. Let me just, let me just. 
I think it's Appendix 4, and toward the end, Appendix 4 of Beyond Sovereignty, and um, I'm thinking it comes up, I think I have a section in there on phenomenology, yeah, on page 285. Uh, I think, that, oh, well, it does come up there. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Hypothetotopian. <laughs> what about the, I thought there was an on the. Well, that's what I mean. I think you're confusing. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's find the other one. Um, okay. And uh, then there is an on hypothetotopian, right? Um, and I thought that one was the more characteristic of how you see the thinking of Yes, the in other words, well, the, the use of those two terms here, um, now, you know, uh, the way I write, it has its many drawbacks, but when I write something down, I don't necessarily have the, I don't feel the need to then go off on a treatise on the implications of this particular yeah. phraseology, but I have it in mind, right? Mm -hmm. So the two words, uh, the one I found first on page 285 in the third paragraph, the hypothetotopian uh, is based on our English, the Greek, and therefore our English word hypothesis, a hypothetical place. So man, I think that'd be a literal translation. And I'm ascribing that um, to Husserl's phenomenology. So I would say that Husserl's phenomenology, that is the notion, his, his philosophy, which is really a kind of full-blown phenomenology is what it, what it is, um, is basically the notion, a la Descartes, but now in a more sophisticated and post Hegelian context, uh, it's the notion that we can abstract our conscious experience from the question of the existence or the substance of the world that we're, the life world, he would call it, right? So he's taking he's taking in a more formal and technical way and amplifying in a very original way uh, in his language a distinction between the, the, the life world and the, and the science world, right? Uh, which is built into the dichotomy that exists in the meditations, which is overcome, right? Uh, I, think you could, I think it's fair to say that Husserl is in no hurry to overcome the difference as Descartes is. He's going, Descartes is too uh, uh, impatient. Uh, so Husserl is exercising a, a kind of intellectual patience. And what he's doing is he's examining what we experience phenomenologically, how, how things appear, right? so, from, from which we get the term phenomenology. Um, s bracketing, setting aside uh, the question of the, whether the world exists or doesn't exist. That leads him immediately to the notion of essence in a very special sense for him, is, uh, which can be appreciated when he speaks of, and it's not at variance with the notion of intelligibility, right? But he's adding something to it. And what, what's distinctively being added to it by Husserl is the notion that the essence of world cannot be gotten by examining this world, by this world I mean the world of our ordinary, normal living experience, right? We, we're in a world, right? As Husserl, uh, as Heidegger was at great pains to point out after Husserl, right? Uh, so we're in this world, but if we want to know the essence of what a world is, we need to compare it to an indefinite number of worlds. It's a kind of a Kantian kind of retro move back to Kant and then back again immediately, right? So the, in Kant, the idea is really a kind of the end point of an infinite number of possibilities, right? And it's carried over by Leibniz for this actual world, says Leibniz, is the best of all possible worlds, not an accident, right? Uh, so possibility is seeping uh, in and around all the, uh, the basement floors of uh, modern consciousness. And in Husserl's case, the question is that we have to imagine, speaking of imagination and fancy, here we get free reign. Uh, you can imagine, use your fancy as much as you want, you can imagine all possible worlds, as long as they 
They're one form or another of world, any possible world you can imagine. And we need to go through in principle now. I don't know if you could, how long it would take them to do this in actuality. But in principle, the essence of the world is the essence of all of these possible worlds. It's what remains constant. It's a projection of self-consciousness, you see, ultimately. It's a projection of the fact that the, the transcendental uh, realm for Husserl, despite everything, despite his continuing Cartesian Hegelian passion for objectivity, is grounded in an irreducible subjective transcendentality. So the essence for Husserl is what's discovered by an infinite variation out of the ego uh, of the notion of world. And whatever doesn't, whatever remains constant through all of that change and variation in particular worlds, you see, oh, modernity's got a thing in for particularity. It's really, right? Because it's another. It's identified with something that remains the same. Correct? Yeah, but that's not the particular, right? In other words, I, I, a thing in for particularity, I'm saying. It's not oh, a kind of thing for it. particularity. Got it. Got it. Right? Right. Well, Husserl, uh, Hegel reduces it to uh, nothing in itself, yeah. basically. And uh, uh, Husserl, in a quite Hegelian spirit, in a very different context, wants us to examine all possible worlds and ignore <laughs> all the particular differences and get that one unchanging uh, universal essence. So the essence becomes a universal in modernity. That's another important. Right. Uh, uh, we, Instead of it being the particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it shifted. It begins in Descartes. I think I kind of yeah. allude to that in the, the new universal in Descartes right. is the cogito. And, uh, and Kant picks up on that in the, what, what right. We, right. the I think, right? Okay. Okay. So now, uh, so I'm saying the whole procedure on the face of it is hypothetical. Right? That, that, so I use the big mouthful. Right? In the thinking now occurring, I say we're dealing with an absolute phenomenology. We're dealing with a phenomenology which is not the product of, or the result of, or the residuum of a of, of being distinguished from a substa the substantial world, the world of substance. Right? So the appearance and the substance, which I say right away in um, in the appendix, well, not right away, literally, now that I think of it. No. But I say it before, I re right away at the beginning of uh, uh, appendix gamma in, um, in uh, Novitas. Novitas Mundi, where I'm dealing with another way of understanding what I'm saying on another dimension from another angle is that that transformation of the universe in and as the body of the risen the human body, the, the resurrected body of the, of the incarnate word, uh, if that is what the universe is, then the universe is to be understood as a, I'm going to put it gently here because I don't want to go through all the nuances in the text of Gamma, right. but the thrust of it is minimally, as, and maybe more than minimally, by implication, the universe is the Eucharist. It is, but in that working out of the implications of the Eucharist in the liturgical sense, and its identification or its following out of the implications of the Eucharist in terms, in cosmic terms, so that the universe itself becomes a form, a Eucharistic, a Eucharist, the Eucharistic form of existence itself, something like that. Um, Part and parcel of that uh, working out is the collapse of precisely what Husserl is depending upon, what Kant depended upon, what Hegel depends upon in the negative, insofar as he wants to establish the intelligibility of the world of appearance through the dialectic. Uh, in the thinking now occurring, remember I said we don't go through the syllogism, we don't go through the dialectic, we have already arrived. And so absolute phenomenology suggests that there's no background, there's no, there's no bracketing. Or another way I put it playfully, it's an absolute bracketing. Right? It's so bracketed that it doesn't, the, the world as substance or existent over against phenomenology, the phenomenology of the mind, 
doesn't exist. No more than nothing exists, right? Something like that. So I think I answered. Great. I, have, I wanted to go back to the, the resurrected um, body and, and Christ. I had a quotation from Beyond Sovereignty from um, page, um, top of page 11, I believe it is. Arabic uh, numeral? Um, I think it's in the body of the text. Um, Arabic, yeah. Um, yes. So the, it's at the top there. Uh, I accept salvation as to create Christ. Now for the first time in history, the ego hears, as such, the godly imperative of God. Create Christ's salvation. In hearing, I'm sorry, in the hearing of this word, the ego is stripped of the essence of self-consciousness. In acting on this imperative, the ego is for the first time pure other consciousness. The thinking thing is the absolute actuality of the other for the first time. So I think the first thing I wanted you to comment on was this imperative of creating Christ's salvation. Okay. Um, you know, I'm big on context, so, um, so it's good that we open up the book. Uh, this uh, comes in the context of, um, uh, beginning at the bottom of page 10, it starts with a reference to Walt Whitman and then to Jonathan Edwards, followed mm -hmm. by Jonathan. 